So we've gotten to the last chapter of the course that we go over, and it's one of my favorite chapters because of all the gross, nasty things that happen. So, you know, if you didn't contract a bacteria or a virus or a fungus, there's parasites that we got to worry about as well, and they are generally larger. And so a lot of these worms, parasites, aren't microscopic. So I always have the question, well, why do we talk about a microbiology? Well, their eggs would be microscopic, and that's usually how they're spread. So let's get to some of these fun, gross, <laughs> nasty parasites. So a couple basic part or a couple basic things with parasitology is, I mean, it just means we're studying parasites. There are a lot of parasites out there, so we do group them into protozoan parasites and helminths. The protozoan are small, single cellular organisms. They, you know, they're a whole eukaryotic cell that causes lots of issues for us. They're parasites. And then we have the helminths, which are all the worms, which are the grossest ones of them all. But there are a lot of parasites out there. They cause about 20% of all infectious diseases. You know, everyone always thinks, ah, oh, it's bacteria and viruses that's going to cause the diseases. But about 20% of all infectious diseases are caused by different kinds of parasites. Now, they are less prevalent in industrialized countries like ours, but we are seeing more and more cases of different types of parasitic infections and those that have weaker immune systems here in the United States, especially those that are AIDS patients. So we're gonna first talk about the major protozoan pathogens. So these are all single-celled organisms. They act like animals, they feed, they cause issues to us, um, and they generally have some form of motility or mobility to get around, not all. Now, there are an estimated 100,000 species of protozoans. So there's lots of protozoans out there. However, there's about 25 that are important pathogens, meaning they cause disease to us. So most of, there's a lot of protozoans out there that don't cause us any harm, and about 25 that do. Now, their life cycles, they usually come from some type of simple asexual cell division, and they're gonna have an active feeding cell. So they're almost gonna have like an adult form that is feeding, called the trophozoite, but they can also go dormant and form inside of a cyst. And that's a lot of times how we pick them up is ingesting the cyst. Some of them have a little more complex life cycles. Some even have asexual phases and sexual phases, but we'll get into some of those as we go through some of the specific protozoans. So these are the parasites we're gonna talk about. Again, we group them into the protozoans and we group them into the helminths or the worms. So we're gonna start at the top, we're gonna eventually work our way all the way around. Now, most of the protozoans have mobility, and we group them based on their mobility. So the first ones we talk about are in the amoeba group, which means they kind of ooze around in an amoeboid fashion. We have the ciliates group, they have cilia. We have the flagellates group, and then we have a group called the apicomplexans. These aren't, they don't have mobility, but they do have a complex of usually some type of organ attachment that allows them to get from host to host. Although they don't physically move, they still figured out a way to get from host to host. So we're going to start at the top with the amoeba. Oops, sorry. Now, the first main group of amoeba even has the word amoeba in it. Entamoeba histolytica, which causes amoebiasis. Now, this particular protozoan, it does alternate between a large modal trophozoite stage. I'm going to see if this will play. Nope. Um, it was just an oozing little amoeba. And a smaller non-modal cyst. So the large modal, again, they just ooze around, and the cyst isn't modal. The trophozoid itself has a large nucleus, and it lacks most other organelles, but it's still a single-celled eukaryotic organism. Now, how we usually pick it up, we are sometimes the carrier. We are the primary host, which means we're the ones spreading it from human to human. Now, how you pick it up is you swallow the cyst that non-modal form, they arrive at the small intestine, that change in pH actually stimulates the cyst to release four trophozoites. They then attach somewhere in your small intestine, they multiply, and they actively move about in your intestine, and they feed there. 
So you got them living in there. Now, it's actually Entamoeba histolytica is a quite common amoeba. 90% of patients are asymptomatic, which means you might already be carrying this particular organism in your small intestine and have no idea because 90% are asymptomatic. Now, most cases of this are in more developing countries, but we still have thousands of cases of this particular organism here in the United States. Now, on occasion, the amoeba is not just gonna stay happily in your intestine being asymptomatic. It can secrete enzymes that dissolve tissues and go into deeper layers of the mucosal lining of your intestine. That causes dysentery, abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, and weight loss. And so it starts to damage the actual intestine itself. This is where you get some of those basic symptoms is that damage the intestinal lining. And about 10%, means one in every 10 people, carries this particular organism with them. Again, mostly asymptomatic in patients. Now again, if it can damage the intestinal wall lining, it can cause more serious side effects. Instead of just having those symptoms of abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, it can be more, it can develop into a more life-threatening disease. It can cause hemorrhaging, appendicitis, perforation of the intestine. You might have some tumor-like growths. Um, you might almost get, they almost look like little cancerous growths, the amoebomas. They might get to the liver, they might get to the lung. In severe forms, depending on how bad it is, depending on immune system, depending on healthcare, it has a 10% fatality rate. Now, how they diagnose a patient for Entamoeba histolytica, well, they're gonna do a fecal smear and they're gonna be looking for either the cyst stage, the non-modal, or they're gonna look for the modal trophozoite stage. Treatment, we do have some antiprotozoan drugs that we can treat it to kill them. Again, most, most are asymptomatic. Now, fecal smear, again, this is what they're looking at, the two stages, the trophozoite. Here's one huge, large trophozoid. It's a single cell, but this is the oozing around stage. And it does feed on red blood cells, which is why you get these dark, kind of almost a reddish pigment. This has red blood in it. Here's the more cyst form that even has three little nuclei it's with the little black circles, uh, the little black arrows are pointing to. So I'm like, it's just they're looking for that either that infective stage, the cyst, or they're looking for that trophozoite stage. Some other amoebic, so they move in an amoeboid fashion, organisms that affect humans. These are rarer. Now, these are all, are, and these are tied. There's two of them, Nigleria fowleri and Acanthamoeba. They are both tied to water. Most amoeba, because because they ooze around, are usually tied to some type of water source. And an Aglaria and fowl, the Nigleria and the Acanthamoeba both follow that same, as they are found in water sources. Now, most of them can withstand um, chlorine, small doses of chlorine, and so pools are not ruled out. They could potentially carry it, but most of the time it's picked up in ponds, in water and ditches, in slow-moving streams, um, but it's, it's a deadly organism because it's usually acquired is that the organism can get into the body in the nasal area is that you breathe it in. So if you've ever gone underwater and accidentally breathed some water in, you might be breathing some of this in with it. It can also get into the eye as well. Acanthamoeba is more known going in through the conjunctiva of the eye than Nigleria fowleri. And so those that are contact wearers, if you've ever had to use tap water to put this, you know, to rinse your contact versus a saline solution, acanthamoeba put, you know, is a, you're at a higher risk of picking up acanthamoeba because acanthamoeba can survive some water treatment facilities and it could be found in well water as well. Now, what they can do, well, they could cause eye infections, but normally if they're causing eye infections, they're gonna get right there next to the brain and they eventually get into the brain. And once they get into the brain, it is almost always fatal. These are amoeba that destroy brain tissue. Now, I'm like, there are cases, luckily most cases, we live up in the upper United States, most cases are found in the southern states. 
this amoeba cannot survive freezing temperatures, which yay for us, whether you like freezing or not, it does keep this organism at bay. But we've had cases around here. Uh, the one in Minnesota that's on here that makes the Minnesota the orange, and like was at a water park. It can survive small doses of chlorine. And yes, when you're in water parks, you're breathing in water all the time. Uh, another thing that puts individuals at risk because it can survive some water treatment facilities are people that use neti pots. You are literally putting water up into your, your nasal passage and this organism can survive in those neti pots. So if there's ever water left in your neti pot, this organism could be thriving and then you're putting it right up in there. And so that's another thing to be worried about if you use a neti pot, just you know, make sure you rinse it, make sure you dry it all the way in between. Now our next group, we're gonna, uh, the next group of protozoans are the ciliates. And there's only one ciliated protozoan that causes human disease, and it's the Balantidium coli. Now it's an intestinal ciliate. Part of its name coli is because it affects the colon. And so it's an occupant, it's found in the intestines of domestic animals, so your pets, as well as farm animals like pigs and cattle. We pick it up by ingesting that any food or water that has cysts, which because it's found in the intestines and we pick it up eating cysts, it's a fecal oral spread. You're eating some type of food or water that's contaminated with fecal matter. Now, the trophozoite, this adult ciliated stage, not the cyst stage, I'm like, is the one that erodes away at the intestine and it usually gives some type of intestinal symptoms. Usually you're gonna have diarrhea. It's generally your big, your big intestinal symptom. But it rarely goes any farther than that. So it's more of an annoying, not deadly organism. So they generally only grow under anaerobic conditions and in the presence of our own microbiota, our own bacteria. Healthy humans are more resistant to getting it, so those that are at a higher immune system deficiency are going to be more likely to suffer the more serious side effects. It's treatable. We do have antiprotozoan drugs that can treat it as well, and you can get rid of it. Now, quick little concept check before I go on to the flagellated stage. The Entamoeba histolytica primarily invades what body part? Well, it is one that affects the small intestine. And again, a lot of individuals are carriers of this particular entamoeba. Now, our flagellated organism, we're gonna start with the trichomonas species, which we call the trichomonids. Their shape, they say they have a little pear shape, they're smaller, and again, they're gonna have a flagella. So depending on the organism, some have multiple flagella, some have them kind of hanging off on weird sides, but uh, they exist only in the trophozoic form, so there's no cyst form. And there are three trichomonas organisms that do infect humans. The trichomonas, the vaginalis, the tenax, and the hominis. The one we're gonna talk about because it is the most common is the trichomonas vaginalis. Now, Based on its name, it can affect the vagina or the human uro and genital tract, and it causes an STD, it's spread by sexual intercourse, called trichomoniasis. Now, 50% of those that are infected are asymptomatic, which means you could be spreading it without having any idea you're even a carrier. It is a strict parasite, which means it can't survive outside the body for any period of time and there are about three million cases a year. It is a top sexually transmitted disease. People just don't talk about it. No one wants to go out and advertise they have an STD, but it is a top STD. Now, the symptoms, females usually are gonna have a very foul, stinky smelling, greenish, yellowish discharge not very appetizing. They're gonna have inflammation of the vulva area. They're gonna have inflammation of the cervix. They're gonna have um, urinary, it's gonna be painful urination and the urge to urinate. So you might actually think you have more of a UTI and then you get diagnosed and it's not a UTI. It instead is some type of parasite that's living in you. Now, how they diagnose is that they'll take a sample of your urine because this will mix in with the urine and they're gonna look for this flagellated stage. Let's see if this will play. Um, 
you should never have anything moving because it's very visible underneath the microscope. You should never have anything moving around in your urine, but we can easily see this flagellated stage moving around in the urine. Um, male symptoms, and they would diagnose same way, looking for those flagellated stages. You're gonna have the inflammation of the urethra, so painful urination, uh, usually thin, milky discharged, and occasionally the prostate becomes infected as well. Again, we do have drugs that can treat it though. Our next flagellate is Giardia, or Giardia intestinalis to be more specific. Now, it has a more unique shape to it. They say it has more of a heart shape, a little bit. Um, I think it looks more like a pear than the other one. But the interesting part is it does have a little suction disc. And so I'm like, it has little suction cups that it can attach right to our intestinal wall lining. Now, this organism is found more in animals generally wild animals in, in humans, but we can be carriers of it. And the top reservoir is beavers, cattle, coyotes, cats, and us. Now, the cyst form that is shed in fecal matter can survive in water for two months. And we pick it up, the top way we pick it up is by drinking contaminated water. So, you know, here's my, nothing's, nothing's quite so refreshing as the taste of cool, clear water. But if you're downstream of cattle that are defecating in water, not so clean anymore. So I usually picked it up with some type of contaminated water or some type of food that has fecal matter on it. The cyst goes into the duodenum, it germinates, it travels to the other part of the small intestine, the jejunum, it feeds and multiplies there. And it causes the condition giardiasis. Now the top symptoms of giardiasis, oh, diarrhea and abdominal pain. But there's lots of things that can cause diarrhea and abdominal pain that we've gone over so far in this class. But there's a more unique symptom that it can cause. Well, it causes you to be gassy or flatulent, but there's lots of things that could cause you to be gassy as well. Sometimes diarrhea leads to being gassy. The unique part about Giardia is it has a very distinct smell when you're gassy or flatulent. It has that sulfur smell, that rotten egg smell. So if you've eaten something suspicious or drank some water out in the environment somewhere and all of a sudden you've got diarrhea, abdominal pain, and your gas consistently smells like rotten eggs, it's a pretty good chance, you're, pretty good recommendation, you're gonna wanna go in and get that checked out. Now, Diagnosis can be difficult but because the organism is shed in feces, but only intermittently, which means you might not be able to pick up some of the cysts or the actual um, adult stage just doing a fecal smear. This is a picture showing the giardi covering the small intestine. So there is some small intestine down there, but this is giardia, it's covering, it's suction cupping itself to the small intestine, leading to the diarrhea. We're not absorbing food. Now, we do have treatments. We do have some antiprotozoans that you could use to kill it. However, your best bet is making sure you boil your water using ozone for a water treatment, and iodine will also kill it. So if you know you're gonna travel anywhere, we don't have a lot of cases of Giardia you know, in tap water, because most of our tap water is ozonated and has been cleaned and filtered. But if you know you're gonna go somewhere where you might drink water that may carry this, you can get iodine tablets to treat your water. You can get certain filters that can even filter out the cyst. Otherwise, you can boil the water as well to kill it. Now, some of our other flagellates, we call them hemoflagellates because these, they're flagellated organisms, but they affect the blood. So they're blood parasites. So they live in blood or in other types of tissues in the human host. Now, because they're in blood and other tissues in us, they can cause more life-threatening conditions. It's not just some diarrhea and some smelly gas. And they're usually spread from some type of animal, and so we call them a zoonosis. Now, how they get from animal to human is usually some blood-sucking arthropod. And depending on the organism, it's very specific on which arthropod spreads it. So these start to have more complicated life cycles. They have more changes that occur once they get into certain animals, insects, and us. Now we 
categorize them based on some of their cellular and infective stages. And there are two big groups of organisms that are the hemoflagellates, the trypanosoma and the leishmania. So some of these stages that we use to categories, categorize them. Uh, the first is what's known as the amastigote. It's the form it lacks a free flagella. I'm actually going to go ahead to this next slide just so you can see the picture. So it's the form it doesn't have a flagella yet. The promastigote bears a single anterior flagella. The epimastigote is the full, it's got the full long flagellated stage. And then what we have is the, tr the tripomastigote. It is a larger form and it has the fully formed shape. So it has the long flagella and it almost looks like it has this back ridge that it uses as well to help move it around. Now, the trypanosoma species causes a disease known as trypanosomiasis, and the trypanosoma are distinguished, because there's more than one, by their infective stages. Now, based on its name, trypanosoma is because it does have that trypomastigote, that, you know, full, long, flagellated stage, but there are two species of the trypanosoma. Trypanosoma brucei and Trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma brucei causes a disease known as African sleeping sickness, and Trypanosoma cruzi causes a disease known as Chagas disease. That's found more in Central and South America. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of them, starting first with the Trypanosoma brucei that causes the African sleeping sickness. Yes, it is found more in Africa, and there are a couple different strains of Trypanosoma brucei but both of them cause very similar conditions. Now it's spread by a very specific insect called the tsetse fly. And so again, it's a blood sucking arthropod. It's a very tiny little fly and the biting of the fly inoculates our skin with the tripo, the tripo mastigotes. They then multiply in our body. They get into the blood supply. They go anywhere where the blood supply goes and they cause damage to the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the brain. Now, the original organism is harbored in many different mammals. And that's where the tsetse fly picks it up is they're biting mammals and they're biting us. Just kind of like mosquitoes do. They bite animals, they bite us, and it's how mosquitoes can spread things or ticks. Same type of thing as the tsetse fly bites animals, they bite, a, bite us, and they can spread this organism. Now, the disease, because it gets anywhere and it can cause damage to different organs, including the brain, and I'm like, the symptoms you can have, sleep disturbances, not being able to sleep correctly, tremors in the body, paralysis, and coma. It's called African sleeping sickness because you end up going into a coma. You go to sleep and you don't wake up anymore because of that damage to the brain tissue. Now, diagnosing it is they're going to actually look for those trypanosomes, those adult flagellated stages in the blood. You can easily see them in the blood. If you do a blood smear, you can see this flagellated stage. You wouldn't normally see that in a blood smear, so it's a very unique, easy way to diagnose a patient. You can also see them in spinal fluid and you can also see them in lymph nodes. Now treatment, you need to start treatment ASAP because by the time you start having neurological symptoms, treatment's usually too late. The damage is already done. But otherwise we do have some treatments if you think you've been exposed to it or have initial symptoms of it. Control is just trying to get rid of the tsetse flight, that vector that is spreading. So anything that can control this particular biting fly or prevent you from getting bitten. So just having different types of insecticides, uh, having bed, uh, the bed nets, things like that. Again, this is only if you're going to be traveling to Africa. But if you have a patient, if you've never traveled to Africa or don't plan on it, but you have a patient that has. And I'm like, it's kind of a big clue to know, you know, travel is important to note from your patients because they can suffer from some of these more unique but common to those area diseases. Now, the other trypanosoma that causes disease in humans is trip trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease. It again is also spread by an insect. The bug is the Reduvig bug, which is also known as the kissing bug. 
Now, this bug is located in Central and South America, as well as in Mexico and the southern parts of the United States. So we have cases here in the United States of Trypanosoma cruzi. Luckily, it can't survive winters and freezing, so unless we have severe global you know, climate change, we might be okay living in the northern part of the states. Now, how we would pick it up is when this bug, this kissing bug, feeds on you, some of the bug feces that carries this organism goes in with the bite site, so it gets in through the skin. Now, the reason why it's called the kissing bug is this particular bug does bite and suck blood, but it likes to go to an area on the skin that's really easy to get to blood and that's your lips. There's a reason why your lips are red. It's because you have blood vessels very close to the surface of the skin. So while you're sleeping, this particular bug will feed on and around your lips. And yes, it can inject this particular organism from its feces into that bite site. Now, some of the initial symptoms, you can have lesions. Um, like you're gonna have a huge sore at the bite site. It might develop to fever, swelling of your lymph nodes, the spleen, and the liver. Now, again, it is more commonly found in Central and South America, but we do have cases here in the United States. But as it spreads around in the body, it can actually get in and cause issues with the heart itself. So the heart can carry this particular organism and it can damage the heart muscle. That actually in Central and South America, the number one cause of heart disease is Chagas disease. So they have a lot of heart disease cases and it's not because they're overweight, it's not because they don't exercise, it's because of this particular organism that damages heart muscle. Now, when I said you could easily see some of these trypanosomas uh, in red blood or in a blood smear, this is all your red blood cells. Here are some very obvious trypanosomes that you can see. Now, this is showing that yes, it can actually get in to the heart tissue itself. So you've got your cardiac muscle tissue and you have some of the amastigote stages in there. It causes inflammation of that heart, it causes damage to the heart. That long term, that damage to the heart causes congestive heart failure. Now, it's treatable, we do have antiprotozoan drugs that we can treat it, but again, the sooner you can get treatment, the less damage that's done. The other hemoflagellate organism is the Leishmania species, which causes Leishmaniasis, also spread by insects, blood-sucking insects, and this one is spread by a fly called a sand fly. Now, it is endemic to equatorial regions, so it needs warmer temperatures. It can't survive freezing. Again, good thing we live in the upper United States where we have freezing in the winter, so if you don't like cold, just be happy that because of that freezing in the winter, we don't suffer from a lot of different organisms. But if you've ever traveled or if you ever plan on traveling somewhere tropical or if you've had patients that have traveled to somewhere tropical, they're at risk of picking up any of these different organisms. Now, kind of the life cycle. So we pick it up by the bite of the sand fly. Now, when the sand fly bites you, it picked it up usually from some type of other animal. Again, it sometimes dogs, sometimes rodents. But as it picks it up and it bites us, it's gonna inject the flagellated stage, the promastigote, into our bloodstream and I'm like, once it gets into our blood, it gets eaten by macrophages. That's what we want to do. Unfortunately, the macrophages can't break it down and it starts to reproduce inside of our white blood cells. It's like a, a great hiding place. So as after it starts to reproduce enough, just two pictures showing the different, same thing, those white blood cells burst and those amastigotes get released back into our bloodstream to get picked up by another sand fly and we can start all over again. Now, and I'm like, it can keep doing the cycle here within a human, but most often the sand fly has picked up this parasite, not from biting us that was an infected, it's usually by biting some type of animal that was an infected. Now, if it can't, I'm like, if it gets broken down by the macrophages and doesn't start to spread, usually you just have a localized infection. You're just gonna usually have a lesion at the bite site. If, however, it does start to spread, 
that's when your body is usually going to start to suffer from more severe side effects. So the cutaneous just is the lesion at the bite site. However, if it starts to spread and your immune system doesn't get rid of it, you can start having infection of the skin and the mucous membranes, usually in the head regions. You have big inflamed areas in the head region, any of your mucous membranes, anywhere in your nose, in and around your mouth. And that's usually a chronic infection, meaning it doesn't go away right away. It can also, as it travels around the body, cause a high fever, weight loss, enlarged spleen, liver, and affect your lymph nodes. Now, the most severe disease of the systemic portion is what's known as the Kala Azar. It's the most severe and fatal form if left untreated. It just means it's affected a large number of body systems and they give it its own special name for its stage. Now a little concept check before we go on to some of our apicomplexin protozoans. So hemoflagellates are transmitted by which method? So the hemoflagellates, the ones that do live on blood, are spread by insects, whether they were the kissing blood, uh, bug, or the sand flies. They're spread by insects. So now we're going to take a look at the protozoans that are called the apicomplexans. They don't move themselves. Instead, they have a complex of organelles that allow them to get from host to host. And we're going to start, um, I'm trying to remember if I go in order. I go in order. With our, uh, we're going to start with plasmodium. So apicomplexans, they are called sporozoans. They usually have some type of spore in their life cycle. They don't have any kind of locomotor organelles. They don't have cilia or flagella or move in an amo amoeboid fashion. They can alternate between sexual and asexual phases, depending on what host they're in. And they are usually spread, or usually, but they can be spread by arthropods, they can, insects, food, contaminated food, contaminated water, or other means as well. And we're gonna talk about the top four apicomplex and parasites that cause human disease. Now, most of the time people are like, nope, never heard of these before, but you may have. Sometimes, again, you don't always recognize the genus and species, or even the genus, but you recognize the diseases that they cause. So plasmodium, you might not recognize the genus, but plasmodium is the genus of organisms that cause malaria. Now, there are five species of malaria. They all cause malaria, so they're all different types of plasmodium. Some are a little more severe cases and have the more severe signs and symptoms, but they all cause malaria. They are all spread by a mosquito, a mosquitoes in the Anopheles genus, and lucky for us, this particular Anopheles mosquito species does not survive here in Wisconsin. We do have some Anopheles mosquitoes here in the upper United States, but not this particular species. So it needs a very specific species of mosquito to spread this particular parasite. Now, other than getting spread by the mosquitoes, it can get spread by blood transfusions, and it can get spread mother to fetus. Now, it causes somewhere between 300 and 500 million cases a year, and it causes about 2 million deaths per year. Again, luckily, we don't have a lot of cases around here, but anywhere where it doesn't freeze, we can find cases of malaria. So southern parts of the United States, is, there are cases of malaria. If you ever are planning on traveling or have traveled, uh, or if you have patients that have traveled to any of these areas, they again are at high risk of picking up this particular organism. Now, it's life cycle. It has several different stages. One of them is the first one. It's the asexual stage, and it's when it's in a human. So it's picked up when a female mosquito bites us and injects the asexual sporozoites into our body. They travel to liver and then do what's known as shizogon a shizogony or asexual division that generates another stage called a merozoite that enters into our blood, supp blood supply or circulation in about a week to two weeks. Once they're in there, they attach and enter red blood cells and convert to another stage called the trophozoite, and they continue to multiply in our red blood cells. 
Now, we can actually see on a blood smear, when we look at red blood cells, you can actually see the trophozoites. They look like small rings with a nucleus on one side. And so you can see this particular red blood cell has three of these trophozoites in it. Some just have one, but your red blood cells should never have anything that look like rings inside of them. It's the main way we diagnose malaria, is doing blood smears and looking for the trophozoites. Now, as they start to divide and multiply in our red blood cells, at some point, they are going to burst and release what's known as the merozoite stage. And so you have bursting red blood cells. That's never good. It is going to be the, one of the top reasons why we have symptoms. So it then goes into the sexual phase after they get released. Here's another picture of those trophozoites. The mosquito, it's being released from red blood cells. And the mosquito, if it bites you, draws up some of the infected red blood cells, some of the gametes that then fertilize and form another diploid cell and forms a sporozoid in the actual mosquito. So part of the life cycle has to take place in the mosquito stomach. So it develops into another stage. Once they develop in the stomach of the mosquito, they then go in and lodge themselves in the salivary glands. So the next time a mosquito bites you, they inject some of those sporozoites into us. So it's, we have to have some development in the, our body, and then we have to have some development in the Anopheles mosquito. Now, I usually have students at this point well, why is a mosquito injecting something when it is, you know, sucking your blood? Well, if you didn't realize, anytime a mosquito bites you to suck your blood, it injects an anticoagulant into you so that when it's sucking your blood, it's not clotting, so that it gets a nice, even, smooth, you know, amount of red blood cells into its body. And it's that injected anticoagulant, it's makes us itchy. Our body is realizing you now have something foreign in the body. So it's an injecting that anticoagulant, it's injecting the sporozoid into the body. Now, kind of diagnosing and what happens if you have malaria. Well, the main symptoms for malaria is you have episodes of chills with fever and sweating, as well as anemia and organ enlargement. But the symptoms occur at every about two to three day intervals. It's the body has a whole bunch of rupturing of red blood cells all at once, and the rupturing of red blood cells causes the chills, the fever, the sweating, but then it stops for a while, and about another two to three days later, you have a whole nother group of red blood cells bursting, causing that chills, fever, and sweating all over again. Now, of the five Plasmodium species, Plasmodium falciparin is the more deadly type. It has the highest death rate, especially in children, and it's nicknamed the de, uh, black, black water fever. That's just because the Anopheles mosquito that carries this particular strain is found more in very dark, stagnant, dark black water. It's where the mosquito is reproducing, which means you're going to have the higher chance of spreading this particular protozoan. Now, diagnosing, again, is looking for the trophozoites in the red blood cells. Unfortunately, this organism has become more drug resistant to the drugs we've usually been able to use to treat. However, we do have some anti-malarial drugs. If you know you're ever going to go anywhere, we do have some prophylactic drugs that you can take so that you don't even, you know, wait till you get malaria. You can stop malaria, stop the organism from taking hold the body. Otherwise, your best control is since it's spread by mosquitoes, have bed nets so when it's feeding at dusk and at night, you're not getting bitten by this particular mosquito, and we've got some of those prophylactic drugs. We don't have a vaccine. They are trying to develop one, especially for that falciparin species, um, but there are multiple species, and it's changing as a lot of organisms are slightly changing. The next apicomplexin that we have is the Toxoplasma gondii, which causes toxoplasmosis. So this is an organism that naturally lives in cats. So this is the one that you may have heard of, like, ah, cats give toxoplasmosis. They can. So it's an organism that naturally lives in cats. They harbor the oocyst in their digestive tract. However, we acquire it by ingesting raw meats, 
not from a cat, or any substances that's contaminated by cat feces. So it causes a disease known as toxoplasmosis, and for a lot of healthy individuals, you would have no idea you have picked up this organism. It's asymptomatic. The only time it really causes big issues is that this is an organism that can cross the placental barrier, and it can cause stillbirths um, and miscarriages. And it can also cause issues, um, brain and heart damage in AIDS patients. Now, it's treatable. We do have drugs that can treat it, but it's got an interesting life cycle. So how a cat picks it up, because not all cats have it, a cat picks it up by eating and biting an infected mouse. Now, once a cat has eaten or bitten an infected mouse, the organism gets into the body and it grows and reproduces in the digestive tract. And it's, yes, for about two weeks, that fecal matter is going to contain cysts, which, if you eat cat feces, you could pick it up. That's one way that you could pick it up, but it's not the only way you can pick it up because people can suffer from toxoplasmosis and they don't own a cat um, or know anyone that owns or, you know, been around any cat at all. But another way that you can pick it up is if these cysts are shed in cat feces, say in a farm cat. Farm cats don't go in a litter box. They go anywhere in the field. And when farm animals are grazing in the field, when they're eating their grass and vegetables, they could be picking up cat feces along with that. And that cyst can actually form what's known as a pseudocyst in the muscle tissue of those farm animals. And so we can pick it up by eating undercooked meat. So eating undercooked lamb or sheep or pork. So one very, you know, one more common way that people pick up this parasite is by eating undercooked meat. But it can get picked up by eating cat feces. Now, I always have students, ah, so this is why you shouldn't clean the litter box if you're pregnant. Yeah, maybe. Um, I am one of those, hey, if you're pregnant and get, get out of cleaning the litter box for nine months, awesome. However, there's a couple things that have to be in play. One, you have to own a cat that has eaten mice. So if you don't have any mice in your house and this cat never goes outside, that means your cat's not going to have this particular parasite. Because cats, once they pick it up, don't have it forever. They have immune systems too and can get rid of this organism. So you have to have a cat that you know has eaten a mouse. And it's only two weeks after it's eaten the mouse that it's shedding that cyst. And you would have had to clean the litter box um, and eat cat feces during that two week time period that it was shedding. So if you own a cat, it never goes outside, you've never had mice issues, you should have no worry about this particular parasite. But again, if you can get out of cleaning the litter box for nine months, awesome, go for it. Uh, again, your more common time to pick it up or more likely time to pick it up is by eating undercooked meat. Another type of apicomplexin that is found in different animals is the, the sarcocystis, which causes sarcocystosis. It's a parasite we find in farm animals, cattle, pigs, sheep, uh, these animals, they're the intermediate host, so again, they pick it up while grazing on grass that usually has human feces. A lot of people still use human feces for fertilizer. Now, we pick it up when the meat from these animals is consumed and it's not fully cooked. It causes your basic food poisoning symptoms, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, um, but it will go away on its own. The organism leaves with the diarrhea, and the vomiting. So there's no specific treatment we have to worry about. So just another thing that can cause diarrhea and nausea. Now another intestinal pathogen is cryptosporidium. So this is an apicomplexin, a protozoan that can affect a lot of different animals. In humans, it causes an intestinal disease called cryptosporidiasis. Now the organism, organism exists in tissues and it exists in an oocyte phase. How we usually pick it up is by drinking contaminated water with fecal matter in it. Again, you eat poop, you drink poop. Now, the biggest outbreak of cryptosporidiasis 
ever in the United States was in Milwaukee in 1994. And I've had students that are from Milwaukee and they've lived through this and they totally remember this happening. Or maybe you didn't live in Milwaukee, but you remember hearing about the outbreak in Milwaukee. It happened in 1994 and over 400,000 people all contracted cryptosporiasis. That's a lot of people. Now, the top symptom for cryptosporiasis, because it is an intestinal disease, is watery diarrhea. So you have 400,000 people with diarrhea in Milwaukee. They literally could not keep the shelves stocked with Imodium and Pepto. They had to set up because this, depending on your immune system, diarrhea can, if you're already immunocompromised, be deadly. And it was, they killed, it killed over a hundred people. So they had to set up makeshift hospitals because they didn't have hospitals for all of these infected people. The interesting part about it is that in Milwaukee, they noticed all 400,000 people that picked it up all lived in one small, you know, not small neighborhood, but one small area of Milwaukee. That it was to the point that across the street from some of these people, no one was infected. It was only on one side of the street that they were infected. Well, they linked it back to the water treatment facility that provided water to a certain part of Milwaukee. That water treatment facility was not doing its job very well. They didn't get this water treated and filtered correctly, and everyone that lived in the certain area of Milwaukee, all of their drinking water, all of their tap water contained this particular parasite. Now, because it did kill over 100 people, uh, well, Milwaukee updated their water treatment facility. They now have one of the most highest up-to-date, state-of-the-art water treatment facilities in the United States because their poor water treatment facility killed people. And so it was a big issue. So, and again, we don't see a lot of cases of cryptosporiasis. although, Mike, the interesting part is it is a parasite that can survive some chlorine, so even pools. There's a reason why, you know, you should shower before you're going in a pool. What if you have fecal matter that you didn't wipe very well, and now you're in a pool swimming, and that ends up in water that people are drinking, you know, on accident? Um, it can spread in pools. So there are occasions that in summers we'll sometimes see a few outbreaks here and there tied to water in public pools. Now, I'm like, some of this I already went over, that yes, it is an intestinal parasite. It penetrates the intestinal cells. That's what's gonna cause, this is the actual parasite trying to get into the intestinal cells. It's gonna cause the gastroenteritis, that inflammation of the intestine causing the diarrhea, causing the vomiting. You might have headaches, probably due to water loss, um, sweating. AIDS patients are those that have a more severe immune system, may suffer more chronic persistent diarrhea. Uh, they can't get rid of the parasite by themselves. Right now, we don't have any effective drugs. It's treating the symptoms is you're treating, replacing fluids, replacing electrolytes, and eventually the parasite should leave with the diarrhea or your immune system should be able to get rid of it. If you don't have the immune system, such as in AIDS patients, that's when it becomes and can be deadly. Our last, oh, almost last uh, apicomplexin is Cyclospora chiatinensis, which causes cyclosporiasis. It's an emerging protozoan pathogen, which means we're seeing more and more cases of it. And now, and I'm gonna say that's true, even in my past textbooks, some of the first textbooks that I started using, it would be like, hey, we never see any infections, it's very rare, and now in the newer, newer editions, it's like, and here's this outbreak, and here's this outbreak. We are seeing more and more cases. It's transmitted fecal oral, you're eating poop, and the main reason is that it can be found in various animals, and when you fertilize fields using manure, feces, sometimes if vegetables and fruits aren't washed properly and it ends up in water supplies, I'm like, you're eating poop, you're drinking poop. So we pick it up by eating usually unwashed or not washed properly, fresh produce or drinking water that hasn't been treated. Once we eat it, the oocysts enter the small intestine, they invade the mucosa, and you end up with some of those characteristic symptoms, watery diarrhea, stomach cramps, fever, muscle aches. The diagnosis can be complicated because it can be really hard to find 
the spores in a fecal matter, and the symptoms, well, there are so many things we've learned about in this class that causes diarrhea, stomach cramps, bloating, fever, muscle aches, so many things you can't just go based on symptoms. We do have some treatments, as though, and I'm like, so it's treatable. Now, because I found this, one of the most recent outbreaks that I just found um, that came out June 30th, 2020, was, and maybe you heard about this as well, a whole bunch of salads got recalled because they had cyclospora in it. Um, I know there's been some vegetable trays that have had outbreaks in the past year or two, and I'm like, it usually is fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, they haven't been washed properly, meaning there's fecal matter on those vegetables or fruits that we unfortunately eat then. Now, my last protozoan is the Babesia species, which causes babesiosis. It's the first protozoan that was ever found to cause a disease. Now, it causes what's known as red water fever of cattle. How we pick it up is through the bite of a tick. So it's the first protozoan that was found to be associated with some type of vector, meaning we need an insect to go from animal to human. Now, it luckily is extremely rare, and it's more likely associated with infected rodents than cattle. So we can pick it up by uh, ticks that bite rodents that bite us. The infection resembles malaria type symptoms. You're gonna have the fever, the chills, the headaches. Um, but luckily it's a very rare disease, but unique that it's the first protozoan that causes human disease. Now, a little concept check before I get to all of our worms. So a person can acquire toxoplasmosis from all of these by eating raw meats, by cleaning out the cat litter box, and sometimes the oocysts, if you're stirring up cat litter, sometimes those oocysts can go in the air. Um, and we can get them in the air. Rare, but it can happen. Now we're gonna get onto the worms, the parasitic helminths. So we're gonna start at the bottom and we're, again, we're working our way up, starting with the nematodes of the round worms, and we're gonna get to the flukes and the tapeworms. So starting with the nematodes. Uh, well, first a little background on helminth or worms. So the adults are large multicellular animals. They have specialized tissues, they have specialized organs. However, we talk about them in microbiology because their eggs are usually what's used to diagnose them, and those are microscopic. So the adult worms, they can mate, they can produce fertilized eggs, which they can then hatch, and then you now have larvae that can mature in several different stages. Now, the sexes may be separate. You might have female worms, you might have male worms, or you might have hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic which means one worm has both sexes in it, which means they can self-fertilize. Now, adulthood and how they mate and the mating occur always in the final host, what's known as the definitive host. The larvae develop in different intermediate hosts, and sometimes they could be multiple intermediate hosts it has to get into. Uh, a transport host just means it's a host that the organism has to get in to further development, but it doesn't cause any damage to that organism. It's just a transport host. But there are four basic patterns of life of a worm and how it can be transmitted. So the first one is the worm develops in the intestines. We'll just go with humans. And I'm like, an egg is released, shed in fecal matter, and then those eggs are picked up by a new host, a new human, meaning we eat fecal matter that has eggs in it. So eggs are shed in fecal matter and then they're picked up from fecal matter. Another type of life cycle is that the worm is in the intestines, eggs are released in the fecal matter, but the eggs hatch out in the environment. And we pick it up when those larval, those hatched eggs, the larva burrow in through the skin. Doesn't sound pleasant, they're not. A third scenario is that the eggs, I was going to say, are shed into the environment through fecal matter. The eggs are picked up by different animals, intermediate host, and then we pick them up by eating infected meat, usually if it's undercooked. And the fourth way, eggs are released from the human, and I'm like, they are infected. You know, whether 
we get it from ingestion or direct penetration. And I'm like, but we release the eggs in some form. It could be fecal matter, could be urine. The eggs can hatch. They can go into a larval stage in one animal. They can go into another stage in another animal. And we can pick it up either by eating undercooked meat or it could burrow in through skin as well. So it's kind of a, a mix of different ways that it can get in the body. Now, diagnosing a parasitic worm, I'm like, is because, well, if you have a parasitic worm infection, it's gonna you know, feed on, it's gonna move around in the body, and you're gonna suffer signs and symptoms because of this accumulation of the worms and accumulation of worm products or the damage to the tissues that it's living in. How we diagnose it, one of the big ways is blood cell counts. Again, when they draw blood, they're doing counts. It gives you a good idea if you're suffering from bacteria, virus, or worms is when you have a parasitic worm infection, you're gonna have an increase in your eosinophils, your white blood cell. And so if you have an increase in your eosinophils, it's good shot right there. That's an indicator that you may have a parasitic worm infection happening. They can also do just some different serological tests, some antibody antigen tests. They can look for eggs, the larva, or even the adult worms in a fecal matter. They can look for sputum sample, urine sample, blood sample, or even tissue biopsies. We do have treatments. We do have some anti-worm drugs that suppress how the worm processes and grows, which means the worm can't move, it can't digest, it prevents it from taking hold in wherever it's taking hold, um, and eventually the body gets rid of the worm. Now, our first group of helminths are the nematodes, which are what are known as the round worms. They look a little bit more like you're kind of earthworm. They're round. They're the most abundant of the animal groups. The vast majority are free living, meaning they can hang out in the soil. They can hang out in fresh water. Um, there's lots of worms out there and there are about 200 that are parasitic that can affect or cause human disease. Now all of them are elong elongated cylindrical, they're round worms. They do have a cuticle, a protective cuticle on their kind of their outer coat so that you know your digestive enzymes don't break them down. They have circular muscles which allow them to move and wiggle and they do have a complete digestive tract which means they have a mouth on one end and an anus on the other end because some of the other worms we talk about don't. So they have a complete digestive tract and they have separate sexes meaning there are female worms and there are male worms. Now the human parasites are divided into intestinal nematodes, which means they're gonna develop at some point in the intestine, and tissue nematodes, which means they spend either their larval life or their adult phases in different soft tissues in the body other than the intestine. So we're gonna first start with some of the intestinal nematodes, and the most common is the Ascaris lumbricoides, which causes ascariasis. It is a large intestinal roundworm. These things are very visible in the intestine. Now, most of the cases in the United States are found in the southeastern states. It is indigenous to humans, which means it is very common to humans, and we are the definitive host. Now, the, you know, how we pick it up. So, Ascaris spends its larval stages and its adult stages in us. It, we then release the eggs in our fecal matter and then it's spread to another human is because another human eats or drinks something or eats or drinks something contaminated with human fecal matter. So eat and poop again, but again, you're eating the eggs of this particular roundworm. Now, once you eat an ingested egg, it will hatch into the larva burrow in through the intestine into your circulatory system. So right away, the larva does not stay in the intestines. It is an intestinal roundworm, but the larva can't develop in the intestine. It has to go to the lungs. So after you've eaten an egg, it hatches in your intestine. That small larva can burrow through the intestinal wall lining, get into your bloodstream, travel to the lungs, get into the pharynx. 
However, as it starts to grow in the lungs, it can't burrow its way back to the intestines, but it has to get back to the intestines. So the main way you can go from lung to intestine is swallowing them. So you have to imagine that you are coughing and this enlarged larva is gonna be coughed up and swallowed back down where it can then finally complete its full life cycle and develop into an adult worm. So you have to eat the egg and then you gotta swallow down that enlarged larva. So you kinda have to swallow it or eat it twice. So just think, you know, next time you cough and swallow, if maybe there's a little something chunky in there, it might have been a larva worm. I like grossing people out. I love this PowerPoint. Now, adult worms complete their whole cycle and they shed once they're an adult. They can shed about 200,000 eggs a day, each worm, which means you can have a lot of eggs that are shed in fecal matter, which means it's only a small amount of fecal matter that you eat, yes, you eat poop, that you can pick up these eggs. Now, the worms themselves, the adults, do retain motility. They don't attach to the intestinal lining. They can move around and wiggle around. So there are a lot of patients that said they, can, they feel nauseous. They're moving and wiggling around. Now, if there's enough of them, it can cause intestinal blockage. So a heavy worm load can slow physical and even mental development is that they're moving around in the intestinal tract and, you know, it's causing all body issues. Now, diagnosing it, well, I don't know if you'd be able to see the worms on an x-ray, maybe. Otherwise, the easiest, fastest, cheapest way is they do a fecal smear and they're gonna look for the eggs. Some of these eggs are very unique and very characteristic of a sp uh, species of worm. Now, another very common roundworm is Enterobius vermicularis. Now it's a pinworm, so it's really tiny. So it's skinny, you know, here's an inch, and I'm like, really skinny. So it's very short, very skinny as an adult. Now it is the most common worm disease in children. Now, it's kid, they're dirty. So how they're picked up, eggs are swallowed. After hatching in the small intestine, they develop into adults. They don't have to go to the lungs or anything else. They just hatch in the small intestine, develop as an, into adult. The interesting part about this worm though, is that the female worm at night likes to come out of the anus and right around the anal opening lay eggs and then go back into the intestine, back into the anus. So you got worms coming out of the butt. They're tiny, but you got worms coming out of the butt at night laying eggs. So it causes intense perianal itching at night. I mean, you got worms coming out and they're laying eggs all over that area. Well, this is why self-inoculation is also very common. Kids are gonna itch back there. They're gonna have eggs now on their hands and if they're not washing their hands and they put their hands and fingers in their mouth, they're re-inoculating themselves. Now, how to diagnose and this particular worm, if you would go to the doctor because the kid is itching nonstop at night, they will probably send you home with something that looks like this. It has a sticky little paddle on it and they're gonna ask you at night to put that little paddle right on the anal opening. They're hoping that some of the eggs are gonna stick. They're a very unique looking egg. They look like little footballs and they're kind of a clear look to them. So underneath the microscope, they're gonna look for those eggs to diagnose it. Now. Fun factoid, I swear when I talk about things in class, it's usually the same time my kids get these things. So one of my kids has had this. As I said, it's the most common worm disease of children. I knew right away what was happening where it's at bedtime, super bad itching back there. Me as a parent and as a person knowing what's going on, I was just, you know, grossed out, freaked out, trying not to freak my poor little kiddo. Uh, the good thing is, Although you could take your kid to the doctor, you can make an appointment, they can, you know, appointment, do all of this. You could diagnose as well based on symptoms, or if you want, you can get a piece of packing tape, you know, it's clear, and a cheap little microscope, 
you can buy those online and look for the eggs yourself. Luckily as well, you know, you can self-diagnose. Because it is such a common disease, you don't even need a doctor's prescription to get the drugs. Amazon overnighted, thanks to Prime, and you can get drugs to treat. The big issue is that self-inoculation can keep happening. You gotta make sure that the bedding is getting constantly changed, lots of hand washing, or it's a chronic infection that never seems to wanna go away. Now, humans become infected by which stage of the pinworm's life cycle? And the only pinworm we talked about was just that recent Enterobius vermicularis, and it's eating the eggs, usually on your fingers. Now, another type of roundworm is called a hookworm. It's called that because the end of the worm forms around as a hook. Now, it has a little bit different life cycles because humans and their feces will shed the eggs, but the eggs hatch into larva, and the actual larva themselves can burrow in through the skin, usually if you walk around with bare feet. So if you're walking around with bare feet, just know there could be hookworm larva hanging out on the grass, hanging out at the beach, that could burrow in through your skin. Now, the two most common hookworms found here in the United States is Nicada, Nicada americanus, even tells you it's found in the United States, um, or in the Americas, and Encyclostoma duodenal. So picked up as it burrows in, now, when it burrows in through the skin, it can travel around in the body. It can go from the blood supply. It can go to the lungs. Again, they can go back up. It can be swallowed back down. But because they're in the blood supply, these hookworms really can end up anywhere in the body. They don't always and only want to hang out in the intestines. Um, they would like to, you know, reproduce and shed eggs in the intestines, but they can go anywhere in the body. Some of the symptoms, they can cause pneumonia, nausea, vomiting, uh, cramps, bloody diarrhea. One of the unique symptoms is that they have these jagged teeth around its mouth. And it's used to that as it clamps onto different parts of the body, it sucks blood. Now, one hookworm can suck about three drops of blood a day. And everyone's like, oh, that's not bad. Yeah, but there's never just one worm. You can have hundreds of worms all sucking three drops of blood a day. And so you can have a significant blood loss causing anemia. Now, if these hookworms get somewhere other than the intestines and start sucking blood in vital body organs like the heart, it can be deadly. Rare, but it can be deadly. Another of our roundworms is the Trichinella spiralis because it actually does kind of form a spiral shape inside of the cyst and we pick it up by eating undercooked pork or bear meat which is unique to eat bear but up, or, up in Alaska uh, they have more cases of that so if they're eating undercooked bear meat is how it's picked up. Now the larva is you're eating the larva it can migrate from the intestines, it can go out into the blood vessels, it can get into the muscles, the heart, the brain, and it can form cysts in any of these different body areas. Now the first symptoms is you might have some flu-like symptoms as well as some diarrhea. Nothing bad, you might not even go to the doctor, but after a while you have cysts forming in different parts of the body and you might have now muscle and joint pain, shortness of breath, and you're gonna have an increase of your eosinophils. You have a parasitic worm infection. By the time they've insisted form cysts in different body parts, there is no cure. It is a deadly parasite. It forms cysts in different parts of the body and it's not good to get into the heart and the brain and cause damage to those muscle tissues. Again, it's rare and it's, again, cook your foods properly, especially pork, especially bear, if you ever eat any bear meat. Now, some tissue nematodes. So these are ones that are not gonna get into the intestines. They, again, like to grow to adults and live in various tissues other than the intestines. So they're gonna complete their life cycle, some possibly in the human blood, possibly in the lymphatic system, somewhere in your skin. They are considered filarial worms. They are still long. They can maybe have filamentous bodies, and they're usually spread by some type of biting arthropod. Now, it causes a disease known as filariasis, and it causes damage to the tissues that they form in. Now, the two that 
are most common for most of those filariases are the Bucheraria bancrofti, which causes a condition known as elephantiasis, and loa loa, which is an eye worm. So if you don't like things in your eyes, you're not going to like the picture coming up. Now, the Bucheraria bancrofti, it gets into the lymphatic system. Now, it's spread by mosquitoes. So the mosquito deposits larva into our body when it bites us, and the worm goes into the lymphatic system, and it slowly damages your lymphatic system. It causes blockages in your lymph flow. And so your lymph, which should be circulating around your body just like your blood does, accumulates because it can't flow anymore. It has full on blockages and it likes to accumulate based on gravity in your lower extremities. And so your lower extremities swell to huge proportions which causes what we call as elephantiasis, is your legs and ankles and feet start to enlarge and look more like an elephant. That's because of the damage to the lymphatic system. Now, the unfortunate part is once the damage to your lymphatic system is done, it can't reverse and heal itself. It's the damage has been done. And occasionally, and like, there are times it could take years before you even know that this damage is taking place. Now, a unique smart, crafty thing that this particular parasite does is it lives in the lymphatic system throughout the whole day, except at dusk. You can have some of these parasitic worms leave the lymphatic vessels, travel into the blood supply just at dusk. And it does that for a reason, is because what's most active at dusk? Mosquitoes. And when mosquitoes suck up the blood, they may suck up some of these worms and start the whole cycle again. And so this worm has gotten a little crafty. It lives in the lymphatic system, but it can also travel into the bloodstream at dusk when mosquitoes are most prevalent to continue the life cycle. So they're crafty. Some of these worms, they get a little crafty. They get pretty smart on how to complete full life cycles and spread. The other tissue nematode is the loa loa. It's the African eye worm. It's spread by the bite of small flies. Again, I don't like eye things, and I'm not a big worm fan. I think they're gross, but then I also think they're cool. Now, temperature sensitive worms eventually migrate around the skin and enter in the eye. The only way to get rid of them is you have to pull the worms out from a small hole in the conjunctiva of the eye. We do have some drug treatments on, it's usually best to get rid of the whole worm because the drugs can kill the worm and then having worms in your body in and around the eye can actually cause more issues. But you know, you gotta get rid of the worm. You gotta pull it out from the eye. So again, if you're traveling to Africa where this particular worm is prevalent, you know, just have lots of bug spray. Try to keep small flies away from you. Now, one particular nematode uh, that we talk about too is called the Dracunculus, Dracunculus metanensis. Now, it's found most in India, Middle East, and Central Africa. It's caused, it's a specific type of worm called a guinea worm. Now, it's carried around by an arthropod called the cyclops found in standing water. Now, how we pick it up is if you walk into this standing water, this particular larva can penetrate. It can burrow in through the tissue. It's going to cause inflammation, you know, lesions. It's going to inflammation and irritation and lesions at the bite sites. But the interesting part is, is it starts to grow up and develop and into adult in the tissues on under the skin. It will eventually start to come out. It will form this very enlarged, painful, red lesion, and that's where it starts to come out of. And it usually comes out when you put your foot in cool water. It's like a burning sensation, and the only way to cool it is put it in cool water, because it wants to complete its life cycle. It wants to go back into water and lay its eggs and develop into larvae to start all over again. However, when you put your foot into cold water and it wants to come out, it doesn't come out all at once. <laughs> it comes out just a little bit at a time. So the main way to get rid of it is take a little tiny stick 
and every day wind just a little bit around the stick because you don't want to pull it too hard or you're going to break it and now you have a dead worm underneath your skin. That's going to be irritating, causing an, um, other infections. Instead, you got to pull it a little bit at a time wrapped around a little tiny stick. It's great. However, if you've ever seen this medical symbol, well, the thought that this particular medical symbol is the Dracunculosis metanensis, it's the stick with this worm getting wound around it. Now, lots of efforts from the World Health Organization and the Carter Foundation, President Carter, we've dropped the number of cases of Dracunculus metanensis. We know the life cycle, we know how it spread, that we used to have, you know, there was three and a half million cases in 1986, to just 24 cases in 2015. I mean, that's a huge drop. Again, we know the transmission sequence, we're educating, we're trying to prevent it. We're at the point we're trying to eliminate this particular parasite, but it may live on in that medical field symbol. Now, our next group of worms are the trematodes or the flukes. Now, the trematodes, they say they have a leaf like or leaf shaped body. So it's kind of just wide, um, it's wide and flat like a leaf. They lack a full circulatory system, they don't have a full respiratory system, and they don't have a complete digestive tract. So they have a mouth, but they don't have an anus. So everything that goes in the mouth uh, comes back, back out the mouth. And there are usually intermediate hosts, usually a snail or a fish is needed to complete the full life cycle humans are usually the definitive host, not always. Now one particular fluke that causes disease in humans are the schistosomes. It causes schistosomiasis. It's a very common parasitic disease and there are multiple schistosome species. They all cause schistosomiasis and they like to get eventually into the blood. Now adult flukes live in humans and we release eggs into water, eagle, sometimes in the urinary tract. And then in the water, the early larva, called the myrcidium, develop and enter into a snail. So again, snails are usually, these are tied, these flukes are tied to a water source, and snails are usually a very common intermediate host. It then develops into what's known as the secondary larva, called their cercaria. How we pick it up is if you're in the water, some of these larvae can penetrate the human skin, and it can cause something known as swimmer's itch. Now, there are lots of things in water that can be irritating to skin and be itchy. Well, this could be one, that as it burrows in through your skin, it gets really itchy. Once it gets in, it gets into the blood supply, it matures into the liver, and then the eggs migrate into the intestine, they can be shed in fecal matter, they can get into the bladder and be shed in, ur uh, in urine. And I'm like, but they can get in and circulate around or move around in the body with the circulatory system. Now, this is showing some of those different stages. The myricidium, that initial egg after it hatches, which then it gets into the snail and develops into what's known as the securia phase, which can get released from the snails and burrows into the human host. Again, we magnified it quite a bit. And as they develop into adults, this is showing the female worm and the male worm. They're separate sexes. And the adults can live in our blood supply. And because they get into the blood supply, they can travel anywhere in the body and cause severe complications depending on where they go. Now, we also have some liver flukes, which means the adult likes to inhabit the liver. One is the apostis, apostochoric sin, I'm gonna say, I'm like, I hate saying some of these, the sinensis. And it again, it's gonna be tied to some type of snail. It's gonna need a fish for its life cycle. We pick it up by eating undercooked fish that have one of the intermediate hosts. So yeah, you, possibly if you eat sushi, you're at a higher risk. But just by going out and fishing and cooking your own fish at home, if you don't cook it all the way, you are at an increased risk of picking up this particular fluke. Now, the larva can crawl into the bile duct, mature, some of the eggs are shed in the feces, but because they can get into the bile duct, they can cause bile obstruction. 
and it's usually going to cause inflamed the inflamed liver um, it may cause jaundice usually going to have pain of the abdomen fever may have diarrhea that goes along with it uh, it's generally not life-threatening but these things can get quite large another liver fluke fluke is the fasciola hepatica the fact it has the hepat in it means it's a liver fluke Again, it can cycle between different animals, but it needs some type of snail, usually some type of aquatic plant in its life cycle. We usually pick it up by eating raw aquatic plants, watercress or something else, and the fluke gets into the liver. Again, can cause that bile duct obstruction. Now the organism that causes elephantiasis, is true or false, has an enclosed or a complete digestive tract. And that's true, it has an enclosed or a complete digestive tract, it is a round worm, and it has a mouth, it has an anus. Our last group, last group, are tapeworms. So these are our cestodes, our tapeworms, they are flatworms. So they are very long, they're very thin, they say they're ribbon-like, just kind of like a ribbon or a piece of long scotch tape, they have very long, very flat. They are composed of little, individual sacs called proglottids, proglottids and a scolex which is kind of like the head region and that's the part that grips the intestine so it's the scolex where you're generally going to find attachment devices hooks or suckers or both something that helps it attach to the intestinal wall now each proglottid is an independent unit that absorbs food and makes and releases eggs so each proglottid is an independent unit it feeds and it makes eggs, which means it's got both female and reprodu reprodu or both male reproductive organs. Now, some of the top tapeworm infections are both tenia and the tenia genus, the tenia saginata and the tenia solium. Now, they are also then called the beef tapeworm and the pork tapeworm based on the intermediate host on where we pick it up. Now, this is just showing kind of what a basic tapeworm looks like. So the scolex, the head region, usually has some type of attachment device, suckers, hooks, both. Um, and each individual proglottid has both, you know, male and female parts and does absorption of food. It's that scolex that helps attach itself to the intestinal wall lining. Now, I always as you know, I, well, it's not always, but sometimes students are like, well, how do you know you have a tapeworm infection? Are you going to see them, you know, in your fecal matter? Well, yes. So kind of the top ways, you know, you have a tapeworm infection. I always have students who are like, is it because you're losing weight? No. And yes. So tapeworms, because they feed, they live in our intestines, they feed on what we have in our intestines. So they feed on what we've eaten. They can absorb food through their outer cuticle, through their outer body. So everyone's like, oh, so they eat what we eat. Well, yes, but they also produce waste, which still gives us nutrients. So there can be some weight loss associated with a tapeworm infection, but it's not a weight loss tool. A lot of times you end up being more tired because you're not getting all of the nutrients that you need from what you've eaten. They did used to actually market tapeworm eggs as a weight loss tool. Uh, that sounds gross. Now, to know that you have a tapeworm infection, it's not because of weight loss, and it sounds like the grossest, worst way to lose weight, is usually you go to the bathroom one day, and you look down, and you got a dangler hanging there. You got part of a tapeworm just hanging. Well, you may want to scream, but that would alert other people to your gross situation. So, most individuals' instinct is you'd want to pull it out. However, even if you ripped the tapeworm, you're not going to rip the scolex out of the intestinal wall lining. It's got hookers, it's got, you know, our suckers and hooks and anything else to attach it. And as long as it has the scolex, the scolex, that head region, can continue to make proglottids. So all you've done is rip off some of the proglottids and it will continue to make more. Sometimes you'll see some of the proglottids in your fecal matter. You'll see some of the segments being shed and you'll see it in your fecal matter. Now, um, you can go to the doctor 
they can easily look at your fecal matter, they'll see the eggs, they may see some of the proglottids, they can give you drugs, but my note, it will kill the tapeworm so that that scolex will release from your intestinal wall lining, but you're still gonna have to shed them all, you're still gonna have to poop them all out. So it's just a heads up for tapeworms. Now, how you can get them. So the first one, which is one of the more common ones, the Tinea saginata, the saginata also known as the beef tapeworm. It's extremely large. It can, here's, you know, it can be five meters, 15 feet-ish, five meters long. Now, its head, the scolex, it has both hooks and suckers to attach itself to your intestinal wall lining. We are the definitive host, so we are how it will, you know, the host that it will fully grow up to its full five meters, 15 feet adult. And I'm like, we pick it up by eating undercooked beef. Now, how the beef get it is that they pick it up by eating eggs. So if some human has a beef tapeworm, eggs are shed in the fecal matter those eggs end up on grass because it wasn't in some water treatment facility. If human feces are used as a fertilizer, other animals can pick it up. They can eat the eggs on the grass. It will develop in the muscles into the larva and then you eat undercooked meat. I mean, sometimes it is so bad you can actually see the larva in the meat. Now, if you cook it all the way, totally fine. However, if you eat beef that has this all in it and you didn't cook it all the way, yes, it can grow into something that will look like that in your intestines. Now, for a lot of individuals, asymptomatic, which means maybe you've got one of these right now and you have no idea. However, if you get enough of them, it can cause abdominal pain, it may cause nausea, but you may see some of the proglottids, you know, coming off in the fecal matter. So, you know, every once in a while, you may want to take a look behind you after you've gone to the bathroom. Look for some proglottids. The other tinea is known as the pork tapeworm. So we get it by eating undercooked meat. That larva, that insisted larva, just like this, is in pork tissue. And so in, and I'm like, same thing, the eggs come from our intestine, they get released into the environment, the pigs pick them up from eating the eggs, they hatch, they eventually make their way into different types of muscle tissue, and then we pick it up by eating that encysted larva in muscle tissue. Now, the biggest issue is that if we eat that undercooked meat, that larva doesn't always go straight to the intestine and develop into the full tapeworm. Sometimes the larva can end up in the heart, it can end up in the eye, it can even end up in the brain. And that's not where it wants to complete its life cycle. So instead it will actually in form a cyst around itself and that cyst can cause damage to tissues. So this is actually showing a heart that had encysted larva from this tapeworm in it. It can cause serious damage to tissues. So it can cause seizures, it can cause psychiatric disturbances, Again, you have larva, larva, tapeworm larva in these cysts in different parts of the body. Now, we've talked a lot about in, I was going to say, oh, and I had to put this because I was like, ah, I always have to say, I'm like, sushi, it's undercooked fish. Um, and so you or people you know, maybe big sushi lovers, uh, again, it, if you're eating undercooked anything, you are at a higher risk of picking up any of these different kinds of worms or other types of infections. My note though, a lot of the fish that are used in sushi are grown in hatcheries, which means it's pretty regulated on their water supply, their food supply, and so they're a pretty low risk of having some of these different parasites in the fish, which means low risk of you getting them. However, if you travel somewhere, and they're advertising sushi from fresh, wild caught fish. I just, you know, wanna let you know that you're at a highest risk of picking up some unique parasite by eating undercooked fish that has been caught in the wild. So just know, maybe avoid sushi if it's wild caught. So most sushi around here is all hatchery raised fish. Now we've talked a lot about 
in this PowerPoint as well as other PowerPoints that there are a lot of different arthropods that can spread diseases. And yes, I just wanted to put out like, some of the top arthropod vectors that spread diseases. Mosquitoes are a big one, especially around here. Uh, again, different species can harbor different parasites. And so luckily freezing in the winter does decrease the number of mosquito species in our area. Fleas are another one that can cause disease. Lice, they're a blood sucking arthropod and ticks, which we got a lot, of, a lot of those around here. Now, of all of the ticks, there are two groups. There are hard ticks and there are soft ticks. Just depends on their outer body. Either of them can transmit their own diseases. So if you're like me, I'm not a bug fan. I'm like in summer when these different insects are out, and I'm like, you know, is trying to do anything to prevent yourself from getting bitten, using the bug spray, long clothing, light colored clothing so you can see them, um, avoid being out at, you know, at times of day when they might be out, all of those types of things. So last PowerPoint, lots of things that may have grossed you out, but yep, lots of things that may have affected you, may be currently affecting you, or may affect you or your patients um, in the future. So if you have any questions, let me know.